Hello Year 6, this is Mr Thompson speaking and I'm going to be doing your reading sessions with you for your remote learning and we're going to start a new book this term uh, which is a collection of short stories called Uncle Montague's Tales of Terror and if you haven't guessed already uh, the genre is horror so there should be a few little scares and spine tingling chilling stories for you in here and uh, hopefully it will um, introduce you to a genre that you haven't read much of before and also it should uh, inspire you uh, for your writing which is about um, storytelling again creating a narrative and creating atmosphere uh, and there should be lots of great things you can magpie from these stories to put in your own writing uh, and each day I'll read the next little bit of the book uh, but before I do that I will introduce you to some unfamiliar words we'll come across in the text um, to help you understand what they mean which will help you understand the text and help build better pictures in our heads when we are reading stories to ourselves and then I'll also um, very quickly tell you what I'm thinking about when I'm reading um, this story um, and that should uh, help us bring in our background knowledge um, and also identify key words and phrases um, as we're reading, which should help us enjoy reading a bit more um, if we can use those skills. So the unfamiliar words you might come across today are these. Thicket, which is a small group of bushes and trees growing together, a bit like where a uh, fox or um, creatures might live in a park, a recollection, which is a memory, a paddock, which is another word for a small field for animals, livestock, which uh, uh, livestock are farm animals and they might live in a paddock, feral means wild or untamed, malevolently means evilly, like a malevolent spirit is an evil spirit, a kissing gate is one of these things uh, and you might see them around the edge of parks or around the edge of paddocks and they're special gates that are designed to stop animals or livestock getting in and out and also make it really difficult to get your bike into uh, through the gate because you can get kind of stuck in them a little bit especially if they're very stiff and we also have the word topiary topiary bushes which you might see if you've ever been to uh, a big fancy house to walk around the gardens and they have special trees and bushes which they give a kind of haircut to to make them look like something else so there's this kind of funny shape here there's one that looks a bit like a house maybe this is some sort of rabbit but obviously you have to keep trimming them otherwise they can grow a bit wild and look a bit strange and those words will be highlighted in red when I read you from the Kindle so you'll be able to spot them and you can always pause the video and come back and look at these again if you can't remember what they mean. And what I'm thinking about today when I read. So I'm thinking, I know this is a horror themed book. I know there's going to be creepy things in there. Uh, but what I want to know is how does the author create those feelings of mystery, um, ideas of supernatural stuff, which is like ghosts and spooky things. And how do they write so that it makes me feel scared, even though I know it's not real, it's just something I'm reading. And there's three ways that um, they might do this, and that is by the types of words, the language that they use, um, which would be spooky language, like malevolently from our unfamiliar um, words list. Uh, they might also use symbols, so they might write about things that remind us of spooky stuff. So they might say the trees look like skeletons, and skeletons are obviously kind of creepy. Or they might write about um, an ancient house, and we all know ancient houses have got kind of creepy uh, images attached to them and they also might write clues and the clues are things that the characters might think or that the narrator might notice um, that when we come back to it at the end we go oh yeah because they said that thing and that was linking that was hinting to us um, that this wasn't quite right in the first place um, and all of these things are using kind of using a combination of our background knowledge when we read it's also highlighting keywords and phrases uh, and we're also you're losing those you're using those clues to make predictions and we'll come back to some examples I found of these 
in the chapter that we read at the end of the session. So I'm going to go to the book now. Here's the book. Uncle Montague's Tales of Terror by Chris Priestley. Through the Woods, Chapter One. The way to Uncle Montague's house lay through a small wood. The path coiled between the trees like a snake hiding in a thicket. And though the path was not long and the wood not at all large, that part of the journey always seemed to take far longer than I would have ever have thought it could. It had become a habit of mine to visit my uncle during the school holidays. I was an only child. And my parents were not comfortable around children. My father tried his best, putting his hand on my shoulder and pointing various things out to me. When he had run out of things to point at, he was overcome with a kind of sullen melancholy and left the house to go shooting alone for hours. My mother was of a nervous disposition and seemed unable to relax in my company, leaping to her feet with a small cry whenever I moved, cleaning and polishing everything I touched or sat upon. He's an odd fish, said my father one day at breakfast. Who is? said my mother. Uncle Montague, he replied. Yes, she agreed. Very odd. What do you and he do all afternoon when you visit him, Edgar? He tells me stories, I said. Good Lord, said my father. Stories, eh? I heard a story once. Yes, father, I said expectantly. My father frowned and looked at his plate. No, he said, it's gone. Never mind, darling, said my mother. I'm sure it was marvellous. Oh, it was, he said. It really was. He chuckled to himself. <laughs> marvellous, yes. Uncle Montague lived in a house nearby. He was not strictly speaking my uncle, rather some kind of great uncle. But as an argument had broken out between my parents about exactly how many greats there should be, in the end, I thought it best to simply call him uncle. I have no recollection of ever visiting him when the trees of the wood between our house were in leaf. All my memories of walking through that wood are when it was cold with frost or snow and the only leaves I ever saw were dead and rotting on the ground. At the far side of the wood, there was a kissing gate one of the kind that lets only one person through at a time while ensuring that the gate cannot be left open and allow sheep to escape. I cannot think why the wood or the paddock it had bordered had such a gate, for I never did see any creatures whatever in that field or anywhere at all on my uncle's property. Well, none that you could call livestock at any rate. I never liked the kissing gate. It had a devilishly strong spring. My uncle did not have it oiled as often as he might. In any event, I never once passed through without feeling the strangest horror of being trapped. In the odd state of panic that came over me, I foolishly imagined that something was coming at me behind my back. Of course, in no time at all, I managed to pull back the creaking gate and squeeze through, and each time would turn with relief to see the wood unchanged beyond the small stone wall I had just passed through. Even so, in my childish way, I would turn again as I set out across the paddock, hoping, or rather perhaps dreading, to catch sight of someone or something, but I never did. That said, I did sometimes have company on my walk. The children from the village would occasionally skulk about. I had nothing to do with them, nor they with me. I was away at school. I do not wish to sound a snob, but we came from different worlds. I would sometimes see them among the trees, as I did this particular day. They did not come near, and never said a word. They stood silently among the shadows. Their intention was clearly to intimidate me, and in that they were quite successful, but I did my best not to appear ruffled. I made a show of ignoring them and continued on my way. The paddock was overgrown with long ragged grass and the dry brown seed heads of thistles and teasels and cow parsley. As I walked across the track of trampled grass towards the garden gate, I could see and hear the scampering movement of what I took to be rabbits or pheasants rustling in the undergrowth. I always paused at the gate to look at the house, which stood on its own little hillock, as many churches do, and indeed there was something of the graveyard in its walled garden, 
and something of the church in its arched Gothic windows and its spikes and ornaments. The garden gate was as in much in need of oil as the kissing gate, and the latch so heavy that it took all my boyish strength to lift it, the metal so cold and damp it chilled my fingers to the bone. When I turned to shut the gate again, I would always look back and marvel at how my parents' house was now entirely hidden by the wood, and at how, in the particular stillness of that place, it seemed that there was no other living soul for miles about. The path now led across the lawn to my uncle's door, past a strange gathering of topiary bushes. No doubt these massive yews had once been artfully clipped into the usual array of cones and birds, but for some years they had been growing wild. These feral bushes now stood malevolently about the house, inviting the imagination to see in their deformed shapes the hints of teeth, the suggestion of a leathery wing, the illusion of a claw or an eye. I knew, of course, that they were only bushes, but nevertheless, I am embarrassed to say that I always found myself hurrying along the path that led between them. I was never tempted to look over my shoulder as I wrapped the great hoop of the door knocker to announce my presence to my uncle. A hoop, I should say, which hung from the mouth of a most peculiar creature. The face formed of dull, unpolished brass seemed to hover unnervingly betwixt lion and man. After what always seemed an extraordinary length of time, and just as I was about to lift the door knocker again, the door would open and Uncle Montague would be standing there, as always, holding a candle and smiling at me, beckoning me to enter. Don't stand there in the cold, Edgar, he said. Come in, lad, come in. I entered eagerly enough, but to tell the truth, there was little difference in temperature between the garden and my uncle's hallway, and if there was a difference, I would say it was in the garden's favour, for I have never been so cold inside a building as I was inside my uncle's house. I swear I once saw frost sparkling on the banisters of the stairs. My uncle set off along the stone-flagged hall, and I set off in pursuit, following the flickering candlelight as keenly as a moth. It was part of my uncle's many eccentricities that, though he clearly did not want for money, he never had any truck with electric light, nor gaslight for that matter, and lit the house by candle wax alone, and that sparingly. Following behind him, therefore, towards his study, was always a disconcerting business, for in spite of being in the safety of my uncle's house, I did not feel comfortable to be left in the dark there, and hurried my steps to keep in contact with both him and the light. As my uncle walked through the drafty house, the candlelight no doubt added to my jitters. Its fluttering passage created all kinds of grotesque shadows on the wall, which danced and leaped about, giving the unnerving impression of gaining a life of their own, and scuttling away to hide under pieces of furniture, or scurry up walls to skunk in ceiling corners. After more walking than seemed possible from the size of the house, as it appeared from outside, we arrived at my uncle's study, a large room lined with shelves holding books and curios from the old man's travels. The walls were encrusted with prints and paintings, and heavy curtains smothered the leaded windows. No matter that it was still afternoon, the study was as sunless as a cave. The floor was covered in a rich Persian carpet, and the base colour of that carpet was a deep red, as were the paintwork of the walls and the damask fabric of the curtains. A large fire burned in the grate and made the colour glow, throbbing rhythmically at the movement of the flames, as if this room were the beating heart of the house. Certainly, it was the only part of the house I ever saw that I could describe as comfortable, though I should say at this point that despite having been to my uncle's house many times, this was in fact the only room I had ever been in save for the lavatory. This may seem odd, but it did not occur to me as such at the time. My meetings with Uncle Montague were less of a family get-together and more in the way of a business appointment. Uncle and I were very fond of one another in our way, but we both knew what had brought me here. Hunger. Hunger for stories. Sit yourself down, young fellow, he said, as he always did. I'll ring and see if friends will consent to bring us some tea and cakes. Uncle pulled on the long sash by the fireplace, and as usual, I strained to hear a bell sound far away in the house. Footsteps gradually became audible and grew in volume as they slowly progressed towards the study door. They stopped outside, and there followed a long pause and then three alarmingly loud knocks. The door handle turned, rattling as it did so, and the door opened. From where I sat, the door blocked my view, and all I could see was my uncle standing by the open door, whispering our request for the door slowly closed once more 
and the footsteps faded away into the distance, oddly mingling with their own echoes to produce a strange scampering sound. I should like to have told you something of Franz's appearance, as I am sure you'll be wondering if he was tall or fat, fair haired, but I am afraid that never on any of my visits did I so much as catch the merest glimpse of Franz. By the time my uncle and I had exchanged some pleasantries, and he had inquired as to the current state of my schooling, there were three more sonorous knocks at the door, and uncle, getting up to answer it once again, returned with a tray, in which there was a large teapot, cups and saucers, and a plate of cakes and biscuits. There was no milk jug, because uncle and I both took our tea black. There was a bowl of sugar lumps, and, though I never saw him actually take one, my uncle must have had a considerable sweet tooth, for they were always entirely gone by the time I left, and I never took sugar at all, even as a small boy. We sat either side of the fire, my uncle and I, with the tray on a small table between us, my uncle with his elbows on the arms of his chair and his fingertips together. When he leaned back, his face disappeared into shadow entirely. Your journey here was uneventful, I trust? He asked. Yes, uncle, I said. You saw nothing in the woods? Uncle Montague often asked this question. My reply was always the same. No, uncle, I said, not seeing the need to mention the village children, as I could not imagine they would be of an interest to a man like my uncle. I did not see anything in the woods. My uncle smiled strangely and nodded, taking a sip of tea. He sighed wistfully. <sighs> there is nothing quite like a wood at night, hey, Edgar? He said. No, I replied, trying to sound as though I might have some knowledge of nocturnal woodland. And where should mankind be without trees, he continued. Timber is the very engine of civilization. Edgar, from the plough to paper, from the wheel to the house, from tool handles to sailing ships. Man would have been nothing without trees, lad. He went to put another log on the hearth, and the flame seemed to almost leap out and wrest it from his grip. After all, what could symbolise man's separation from the animal world more than fire? Fire's warmth and fire's light. We both looked into the fire, mesmerised for a while by its dancing flames. The Norse people believed that the world was suspended in the branches of a great ash tree. Did you know that, Edgar? No, uncle. Yes, he said. The people of the northern forests have always had a special relationship with the tree. After all, those ancient wildwoods were their storehouse of building materials and fuel and food. But they were also dark and mysterious, filled with bears and robbers and who knows what else. Do you mean witches, uncle? His eyes twinkled. Witches, warlocks, wizards, wood sprites, werewolves. Werewolves, I said with a little gulp. Perhaps. Uncle Montague gave a little shrug. The point is, they respected the forest, and they respected trees, feared them, worshipped them. How do they worship them, uncle? I said, taking a biscuit and noticing that the sugar was already gone. In many ways, I am sure, he said. The Roman historians tell us of sacred groves of oak trees splashed with blood. Blood, I said, spluttering a little on my biscuit. Yes, Uncle Montague. They tell of sacrifice, sometimes human. The Celts were partial to taking the heads of their enemies as trophies in battle. To them, the hanging of the heads on an oak was probably as festive as the hanging of baubles on a Christmas tree is to your dear mother. I raised a doubtful eyebrow on both counts, and Uncle smiled. But why worship a tree, I said. I can think of many things less deserving of worship. He replied, look at how long some trees have been alive. Think of what they have seen. Why, there are yew trees in churchyards that may be more than a thousand years old, older still than the ancient church nearby. Their roots are in one millennium and their branches in another. And who cannot stand in awe when they see a great oak or ash or elm standing alone like a mournful giant? He tapped his fingertips together and I saw his wolfish smile in the shadow. I know a story about just such a tree, said my uncle. Would you like to hear it, Edgar? Very much so. After all, that was why I was there. It may be a little frightening for you. I don't mind, uncle, I said with more courage than I felt, for I was like someone who, having been hauled to the highest point of a fairground ride, was beginning to have second thoughts. Very well, said Uncle Montague, looking into the fire. Then I shall begin. And that's where we'll end today's chapter and I'll just recap 
the um, things that I was thinking about during that reading with you. And perhaps you might have spotted some of the things we were talking about. What language, symbols and clues were there that helped create feelings of mystery, the supernatural, and help us feel a bit spooked out or even scared. So some of the things I noticed was um, that the author used words such as dead, rotting, feral, uh, rich, ruined, but meant wild and untamed. And all of those things make me think of uh, darkness and give a cold feeling and set my mind thinking of um, something, um, something spooky. Uh, and some of the things that he also mentioned that are traditional symbols of spooky stories. We had, uh, he talked about the woods, he mentioned graveyards, he described some of those topiary bushes that are a bit like teeth or having leathery wings. And the creature that I know that has leathery wings is a bat, which are always a spooky symbol. And some of the clues that um, were in the text that I thought made me think, hmm, maybe not everything is as it seems, um, were these things. So as the uh, child Edgar is walking towards the house, he says, I foolishly imagined something was coming at me behind my back. And he says foolishly like, oh, there wasn't really, but maybe I'm thinking because I know this is a spooky story. Actually, maybe there was something coming. Uh, it also talked about the children skulking in the woods. And those children were a bit weird. I don't know if you can remember why they're a bit weird. But um, they never came near. They never made any noise. They just kind of stood there in the woods, in the dark. Maybe they just weren't. They weren't even children. Maybe there was something else. And when he got to the house and looked around, it seemed like there was no other living soul for miles about. And the author kind of describes that in a cheery way. But maybe that's true. And that there are no other living souls for miles around. And that everything within, um, which is close to that house, might be dead. Who knows? But the next chapter um, will be about the story Uncle Montague promised Edgar, which was about a tree. So you can tune in for that video tomorrow or later in the week.